Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and thank you for joining me for this second Sonic session, Investigating Research Methods. Uh, in our previous session, those of you that were with me, we presented the introductory session to what research methods actually are and how they're used. This second session is a little bit different. I introduce unobtrusive research methods. Unobtrusive research methods. They're sometimes called non-reactive research methods. When I was in the United Kingdom, it was very important to me that I reminded students, indeed I reminded staff, that research doesn't always have to be invasive. When I arrived in the UK, I found so many students and staff doing these very odd little projects where you must do focus groups or you must do surveys, almost as if there were no other research methods available. Then, of course, you know, a student would do a focus group with five people and then pretend, you know, five people who are often their friends, and then pretend that the results would be representative in any way. So this session that you're about to listen to is my answer in some ways to those practices. It's about me reminding students, reminding staff that sometimes some of the answers you require are just under your nose and we need the methods to interpret and understand what is already there before actually creating something that we think we might need. Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon. I'm the Professor of Media Studies at the University of Brighton and I have a confession to make. I'm an historian. I'm an historian. That admission is generally pretty unexpected and unpopular in media, communication and cultural studies circles. You see, the overwhelming majority of scholars in our field commence their first degrees and first training either in sociology or literature. Because most of the field is trained in this way, it means that assumptions about the selection of source material and methods are rarely discussed because we assume that we all have a shared disciplinary background that values either textual analysis and semiotics in its many forms or qualitative methods such as surveys, questionnaires, focus groups and ethnography. I'm going to give you two stories about the consequences of these assumptions on our field of media and indeed cultural studies. The first comes from when I was a master's student just like you. I'd written a, an article on Derek Jarman, the British filmmaker and photographer. It was actually derived from my dissertation. And the reviewer of the piece was absolutely scathing. Ooh, because I didn't use textual analysis for a close reading of Derek Jarman's films. I didn't use surveys to understand the audience of the films. And I always remember the surprise of the reviewer demanding to know where were my surveys where were my focus groups? Where were my questionnaires? Thankfully, the other two reviewers realised that I was writing a cultural history, a cultural history of Derek Jarman's books and films to understand the role of war, AIDS and death in his work. But I realised at this very early stage in my career that assumptions were being made that were the notion that there were correct methods, that there was a way to use methods and a singular strategy to understand knowledge. I also realised that these assumptions were often locked into disciplines with profound consequences for those scholars working in other disciplines and using other approaches. Interestingly enough, years later, I met this reviewer, a very famous professor at a very famous university, and she acknowledged that she did get it wrong, not in methodological terms. She still believed that my methods were inappropriate for that topic, and this was 10 years later. But she did not realise that I came from an historical background. So she said supposedly being an historian was a way to justify my lack of good sociological methods. She still never considered that any other disciplinary approach may be just as appropriate, maybe more appropriate. My second story happened nearly 15 years later. I was marking honours proposals, five of them, all on different topics from the size zero debate to football fandom from Big Brother to anti-smoking advertising campaigns, and every single one of the students, every one of them, 
decided to use focus groups. In each case, in each case, in each case, this was an inappropriate selection of methods. All of them just wanted to talk to 10 students like themselves, identical really in terms of age, race and educational level. So how were they going to gain new knowledge when they were talking to people just like themselves? But because of, indeed perhaps because of a lack of alternative methods being presented to those students, that was the only way they could create a methodological selection. So this was a shame. I remember thinking at the time, we need to give students alternatives, options and ideas that allow them to match methods with their project, with reflexivity and care, rather than assuming that there are only one or two options that are available to them. My argument today is before students go off to complete surveys, questionnaires, focus groups, interviews, or practice-based research through film and photography, it is necessary to look at the already existing archive of materials. There may be, and there probably is, a wealth of data from the census, parliamentary records, letters to the editor, non-governmental organisational reports, film television and screen culture, radio, popular music, podcasts and sonic culture, material culture like fashion, toys, food, technology, and the environment, including the landscape, architecture and graffiti. These are simply a few examples, and I've always thought it's profoundly arrogant to assume that we as researchers are so much smarter than all the scholars, all the citizens who preceded us, that we can interview 10 people in a focus group or send out a questionnaire to 100 people, and that supposedly will give us a richer data set than exists by actually looking at our world. So to be cheeky, ponder my maxim. If we do live in an information age then why do we need more information? Surely we need better methods to manage and understand the already existing information. To provide these better methods to understand the data already in existence, we commence with the work of Alan Kelleher. Alan Kelleher released a profoundly influential book in 1993 that's now out of print. So I've photocopied an extract for you in your readings, and this influential book was titled The Unobtrusive Researcher, A Guide to Methods. He framed his task with great clarity. Quote, This book has been written for the growing number of people who believe that there is or that there should be more to social research than either surveys or in-depth interviews. Much valuable insight can be gained about ourselves and the lives that we lead by simply listening and watching, both systematically and with care. Furthermore, a significant amount of work can be conducted without either engaging with or disturbing the activity of other people. In other words, much of this research is unobtrusive, end of quote. His words have always struck me as incredibly important. We need to broaden out our methodological landscape. We need to value the quiet activities of research, like listening, watching and reading. And also that valuable insights may be gained by not disturbing other people. You see, the moment we ask a question, we interrupt and refocus someone's life away from their agenda and towards our own. This is called the Hawthorne effect, noting that the presence of researchers can disrupt their findings. There is a gentleness and a subtlety to this research corrective. Kelleher's work I found incredibly convincing and motivating. If we use our senses, eyes, ears, touch, smell, taste, 
then new interpretations of already existing data can emerge. In such an approach, interviews and surveys are very, very blunt instruments. The images to hold in our mind are the archaeologist gently dusting and cataloguing the artefacts he reclaims from the earth, or the historian quietly reading the archive of documents that few have read and even fewer have cited. Of all the methods we discuss in this module, unobtrusive research methods are the most interdisciplinary, using whatever strategies exist to extract the most information from already existing sources. The premise of unobtrusive research methods is that the truth, or a truth, of the world is not available by simply asking people what they think. You see, both qualitative and quantitative methods work from the basis that something representative can be captured through interventionist research. And that's why, of course, there's so much attention to sampling. Surveys and interviews are really easy to do and the easiest way to gain quick empirical data. But the spillage into empiricism, that some form of truth is being discovered, remains an unspoken assumption. So I remain interested in methods, methods that do not disturb or change the social environment, the skin of information, if you will but make us as researchers work a bit harder to understand, interpret and comprehend this data. Many media studies projects are really well suited to unobtrusive methods. City imaging and urban regeneration projects can be analysed through reading a local government report, looking at architectural plans, reading the landscape. Popular music projects can be developed through hearing the music and searching through fan blogs on the web. Indeed, one of the greatest strengths, I think, of user-generated content, or Web 2.0, is that it leaves a proliferation of voices and views through blogs, wikis, MySpace, Facebook, YouTube. So, remember for me, unobtrusive methods do not include, they do not include interviews, They do not include questionnaires. They do not include manipulative experiments or tests. Well, what methods are left? Let's think about the strengths of unobtrusive research. Well, firstly, unobtrusive research is inexpensive. The only expense is actually the researcher's time. But this independence of funding bodies has a consequence on the validity of the results. Conducting interviews, conducting questionnaires and surveys is really expensive. Researchers have to get grants and frequently involve research assistants. But these grants can impact on the independence of the process and the outcomes. If a bank is funding research on the impact of the deregulated market on the banking service in rural or regional communities, then a particular sort of research is going to be supported. A lot of different types of research will not. Secondly, the other advantage of unobtrusive research methods is that we study actual rather than reported behaviour. Put in basic terms, often people do not tell the truth about their own lives. In the desire to be representative in the sampling, There's little recognition that the people we sample may actually lie about their lives. They may not understand the question or they intentionally want to subvert the results. Let me give you an example. The best example of this is in the last census in the United Kingdom in 2001. Brighton and Hove had the highest percentage of citizens who indicated their religion as Jedi. Now, Brighton may be filled with Sith Lords and ruled over by the Jedi Council, and indeed, we all may feel the Force in some way. But here is a great example of a large number of people actively not telling the truth about their lives. 
For us, as unobtrusive researchers, our question is different. We ask, what is it about Brighton that means that the Jedi quota was so high? And, for example, what do we learn about, say, Australia's former social and political system, that in the last census of the John Howard government, the John Howard government actually banned citizens from listing their religion as Jedi. In fact, if you did that, you had the threat of a $10,000 fine. But whenever you think you've received accurate and truthful information by asking people, always remember the Obi-Wan Kenobis wandering around the lanes of Brighton. A third advantage of unobtrusive research methods is safety. Important one, actually. Unlike ethnography and participant observation researchers who go into footballing communities or drug-taking communities, unobtrusive researchers are not undercover. They're not maintaining multiple identities as a dancer and a researcher or a fan and a scholar. For unobtrusive researchers, our role, our identity is clear. It's not dangerous. We're not going somewhere strange and behaving oddly. A fourth advantage of unobtrusive research methods is repeatability. Now, as I've got older, and I'm very old, as I've got older and indeed a bit more experienced, this one, repeatability, means a lot more to me. If there is ever any doubt about our findings, then readers can go back to the source and check our data. Whereas, of course, interviews, surveys, questionnaires are of their time and place and derive from a particular group of people. When I've done my research, for example, on online education, trying to intervene in the assumptions that more technology is always good technology for teaching and learning, I've gone to the publicly available material from universities around the world. In other words, if I'd conducted surveys or interviews, then my arguments could have been dismissed as the views of a few people. But by using freely available university marketing materials about online education to show the costs and the consequences of this scheme on students and knowledge, the argument becomes more convincing. If readers doubt me, then they can go to the university's website and see the source for themselves. They don't have to rely on an interview that only I have access to. Fifthly, These unobtrusive research methods are non-disruptive. We are not changing people's direction of thought through surveys or interviews. Raymond Lee, in your reading for this week, makes a great point that through interviews and questionnaires, respondents are trying to construct a version of themselves and they tend to over-report or under-report particular sorts of social behaviour, like drinking, drug-taking and sexual proclivities. Instead, unobtrusive researchers look at what is available, what sources life has provided on a particular topic. So in terms of ethics, we are not damaging our subjects through our research. So let's think of an example. If I was to conduct, say, a survey on obesity, health and fitness, then the questions that I could ask could have a huge impact on the self-esteem of the people I'm talking to. While I'm gathering data, the consequences of my questions on body image may hurt the person very much and disturb their understandings of self and identity. Finally, unobtrusive research methods offer a critique, a strong one, of empiricism and positivism, the notion that research allows us to discover the truth about the world. Unobtrusive research does not rely on sampling, does not rely on generalisable data on school leavers, British Asians, divorced men or young people. We critique the notion that methods allow us to measure and determine a truth. We question particularly already existing theory We don't look for representative case studies as occur in many science and health-based discipline. And yet the assumption of positivism survives. The notion that we can measure something scientifically and that that measurement in and of itself tells us something about the world. Unobtrusive research really attacks empiricism. 
often this agitation of empiricism and positivism is termed post-structuralism. While this label is now almost as meaningless as postmodernism, there's no doubt that the impact of the work of Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, transformed our assumptions about the role of methods and how a method transforms our understandings of the outside world. Michel Foucault, in the Archaeology of Knowledge, showed us how discourses block us from alternative understandings of the world. When we are in a discourse, whether it be capitalism, Marxism, or reality television, it blocks other understandings of the world outside of this discourse. So we have a particular view that is inflected by our social positioning. So the idea that an empowered scholar can ask a few questions, conduct a survey or an experiment, and grasp the full meaning of the world from their quite limited social positioning was the lie of academia that Foucault revealed. He was more interested in why one topic of research is chosen over another, why one series of definition was used over others, and why one series of questions was favoured over others. So inspired by post-structuralism, there is much value in rereading already existing materials, texts and environments to discover the assumptions and gaps within them. Similarly, texts dismissed as trivial in the past, such as popular culture, popular music, family photographs, can become incredibly important sources to understand our assumptions about family, masculinity, femininity, love, sex, romance. The point of popular culture, the point of media materials more generally, is not their representativeness. The media does not reflect reality. Instead, the media capture the assumptions, the ideologies, if you like, that circulate in a particular place and time. The best of unobtrusive research is able to probe and question what is not talked about and read those absences in a provocative and challenging way. Keller here finds great examples of reading against the grain reading against the intention, the purpose, and the truth of a text. He looks at the steps or carpets in a house, in a museum, in an art gallery, to assess wear and tear. By finding a worn bit of carpet in front of a particular exhibition, we learn something about its popularity. Look at door handles. Who closed their doors in the family house? Who left them open? My favourite example of this sort of unobtrusive research often occurs with books in archives and libraries. My first published book was written on the relationship between the United Kingdom, Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. This book was called Tracking the Jack, as in the Union Jack. It soon became a book about how the relationship between Britain and and New Zealand and Britain and Australia was actually far closer than the relationship between the near neighbours, Australia and New Zealand. The archetypal neglect between the two nations was captured for me when I was sitting in the library at my then university in Perth in Western Australia. I had in my hands a book published in 1908. Brilliant, 1908. It was a history of New Zealand and it just happened to be deposited in this Perth library. Now, like most books from the early 20th century, the pages actually had to be cut and separated to read them. But this book, that was nearly 100 years old at the time, had never been cut. So it had been sitting in this library for 20 years, and probably many other libraries before it for nearly 100, but no one, not one reader, was interested enough in the Australian and New Zealand relationship to actually read it. Therefore, this uncut book was probably a better source for my study than the words that were found within it. I actually left it uncut. This is unobtrusive research, and I used this uncut book as a testament to the lack of interest in trans-Tasman relationships. 
So you'll see in some of the articles and book chapters you're reading of mine this week how I tend to return to conventional and often overread sources to rethink them in different ways. I've always done that. So much for books, for steps, for carpets, for door handles. What are other more modern examples of unobtrusive research? Well, graffiti is a great one. Graffiti for local councils may seem some sort of destruction of the landscape, but by logging it, by photographing it, by reading it, we learn something about the revisioning of the urban environment. Similarly, cemeteries have nothing to do with the dead. The dead do not write their tombstones. The dead do not choose their casket. Cemeteries are a site of the dead organised by the living. We learn about what the living at any particular time think about the end of their lives. A great example of this is Spike Milligan, the legendary goon and comedian, uh, and his inscription on his tombstone. Throughout his life, he said he simply wanted one phrase on his grave. I told you I was ill. But his family did not abide by his wishes. Well, not really. They put the inscription on his tombstone, but it was in Gaelic. Now, I find it ironic that the comedian who was so often censored by the BBC in his life was even censored in death. That decision was not about the dead, but a decision about the living. So second-hand clothing shops tell us more about fashion than the pages of Vogue. What is literally so unwearable that it must be discarded? There are so many sources that we rarely consider or think about in our desire to send out that questionnaire or survey or conduct that focus group. Perhaps, just perhaps, there is a more subtle, evocative and strange way to find evidence. It's only a graveyard away. Obviously, there are great disadvantages in using unobtrusive research methods, and they are unsuitable for many projects. The first great disadvantage is that we only have the materials that have survived through time. Not only are these materials not representative, but they cut away so much of the population. Those who have lived their lives outside of the public domain often have their lives poured into garbage bags on their death. So historical invisibility may be perpetuated through unobtrusive research methods. Important one. Secondly, unobtrusive research methods are not representative at all. They're not generalisable in any way. Only particular materials survive. And this selective survival must lead to a distortion of the past. Thirdly, there is no definitive interpretation of the data. Now, I find this a really positive thing. You know, it critiques that truth effect of so many research methods. But we have to note, as unobtrusive researchers, that our interpretation is one of many, and every new set of eyes will always see the same material in a different way. We will never be the expert of unobtrusive research methods. We are merely a transitory and a humble interpreter. Fourthly, the unobtrusive researcher must be patient. We spend most of the time gathering little shards of data that may or may not be relevant. There is a quietness to this research that means that our results won't be splashed in the pages of The Guardian or featured on the nightly news. It is a gradual and small process that could be dismissed as irrelevant or non-spectacular. Finally, unobtrusive research methods are inferentially weak. That means we can prove very little from it, like the cornered page of a book, the wear in a step, the change in a notice board, or the wash of graffiti. Causal research, the exploration of the causes and consequences of social behaviour, is the most respected and funded of research in the social sciences. So when you are making a decision about methods, you're actually making a decision about how your outcomes and evidence will be assessed by your readers. 
Perhaps what is most important about unobtrusive research methods is that they ask all of us, to quote Raymond Lee, quote, to think creatively about the sources and use of data, end of quote. When I came to complete my work on Don Bradman and Eddie Gilbert in my book Playing on the Periphery, there was too much information on Don Bradman and not enough on Eddie Gilbert, but interviews, surveys and questionnaires wouldn't help me. Both men are dead, dead a long time, and any interviews or surveys would replicate already existing information in terms of myth and national history. So I thought it would be fascinating to reread the interpretations of both men, transforming secondary sources into primary sources, if you like, rereading the myths of great men in response to post-colonial theory. The result provided some fascinating interpretations that had been neglected in an analysis of Bradman and ignored in the case of Gilbert. It worked well for this topic to offer fresh insights into well-worked documents. Even if you never use unobtrusive research methods in your life, then I hope this session today has some value to you. I hope you'll start to consider your assumptions and ask always if an interview, a survey or a focus group is the best way to answer your research problem. Is there an alternative? If your goal is to reveal the implicit, then using non-reactive data, the archive, the wall of a building, the carpet in a museum, a gravestone, may allow us all to see the past with new eyes. Thank you for listening to that session on unobtrusive research methods. That one proved very, very useful for students and many of them went on to really think creatively about methods in their research. So even if students do decide to mobilise more reactive research methods and involve themselves in creating new data, it at least reminds them that there's plenty of data there. They just need the interpretive skills and information literacy to interpret it well. Thank you for listening.